As you said, I am pastoring two churches, and I'm taking care of two churches, but in many ways, during this time of grief, the churches are taking care of us, right? So that's why we're here. We need fellowship. We need each other. It's this symbiotic relationship. In fact, many of us here today have distinct memories of Uppy, memories we'll cherish for the rest of our lives. And for a few moments now, I just want to share some of the most fond memories that I have of my Uppy. And for starters, if there's one word, if there's one word that I could use to describe Uppy, it would be the word persistence. Persistence. Persistence is the quality that someone has that allows us to continue in a course of action despite opposition or obstacles and difficulty. And if anybody knows Uppy's life story, you know that she was a persistent individual. She was persistent with her love for her family and she was persistent with her faith in God. Amen? Amen. So I lived with Uppy for my entire upbringing, 18 years in more or more. We lived under the same roof. And while I was growing up, while she was my grandmother, in many ways, she was like my second mom. You know, when I was a baby, I would sleep with my Uppy. And there were times, in fact, that I would ask to feed from her tete. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> Let's not. I always felt that Uppy gave me her undivided attention. She was persistent in her affection for me, and I have vivid memories dancing with my Uppy, the Mizo Kualam. I, she would be, you know, doing something, and I would walk into the hallway, and I, I start dancing with her, and I start singing, and she would stop what she was doing right then and there, like I'm the only thing in her universe, and she would dance with me. That's who Uppy was. She was persistent in her affection for me. When we were in school, Uppy was our babysitter. Uppy would pick us up from school every day, persistent. She was reliable. She was always there. And during this time while I was in pre-K, I was a very young little boy, there was a short period of time when I accidentally peed my pants every day before school was out. One day she picked us up from school and this was a reoccurring uh, incident and she saw that my pants were wet yet again and I remember it so vividly. I was wearing blue corduroys, and she started screaming at me in miso, and she slapped me so hard on my leg. <laughs> I was terrified, and I never peed my pants again. <laughs> and I would like to say that was the only time that Uppy scolded me, but however, that was not the case. Uppy was persistent in her scolding of me. <laughs> and looking back, I, I probably deserved the majority of, it, majority of it because I was a very mischievous little boy. I never learned miso fluently, so when she would scold me in miso as a little boy, it was that much more terrifying because uh, I didn't know what she was saying. <laughs> Here are some of the common phrases that I'll always remember my uppy telling me, this little mischievous boy. <laughs> And her favorite phrase, I heard it on a daily basis, that she would say to this little boy, I think all those somewhere mean you're a very good little boy. I couldn't communicate uh, in miso with my broken miso so well, but Uppy was a persistent learner. She tried her best to learn a variety of English words, and one of my fondest memories of Uppy uh, is, involves the way in which she would pronounce English. My dad, Richard. Richard? Richard? 
my sister, Daphne. Daphne? <laughs> Daphne? And, and me, Rajik. <laughs> if I came home with something new, a new shirt or a bag, she would always be concerned and curious and she would say, where did it come from? Where did it come from? <laughs> And as you heard earlier, she was very concerned with money. She wanted to save money. And a common phrase she would always say is, very expensive, very expensive. <laughs> and yet, at the same time, Uppy was a persistent giver. With what little money she had, she gave to her children and her grandchildren. And she gave faithfully and persistently to the church. Uppy was persistent in her faith towards God. I witnessed this particularly in her prayer life and her devotional life. There was never a time in my life in which I could walk in her room and not see a devotional book on her nightstand. In particular, she would love to read Patriarchs and Prophets. And as a little boy, the imagery on that cover of that book, Moses and the Ten Commandments, it, it, it made an impression in my imagination as a little boy. And somehow, even though I was young, I knew that my uppy knew God. Whenever I had to travel far later in my life, if I was leaving out of state, uppy made sure to gather everyone for corporate prayer, and she would pray those long, earnest prayers that would almost make you fall asleep, <laughs> all in miso. So I didn't know what she was saying, but you know, after those prayers, I always felt a sense of holiness there. Shem? <laughs> and standing here today, I wholeheartedly believe that my own conversion and my subsequent call into ministry is directly and intimately connected to, to, to the persistent faith of my uppy. Amen? Amen? She was faithful, 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 and persistent in her faith in God. Uh, for, these last, um, uh, for the last few years, my wife and I, we lived far away in Tennessee. But when our daughter Mila was born, God opened up a way for us to move back to Maryland. And out of 10 great-grandchildren, if I'm counting that correctly, Mila is the only girl. And the last year and a half of Uppy's life, she got to spend every day with her only great-granddaughter. I'm so thankful I got to watch that relationship blossom. And my dad explained earlier uh, every morning after breakfast, Mila would run upstairs by herself, unsupervised, all the way to Uppy's room, and Uppy would feed her raisins that she stored on her shelf. And in fact, it was such a regular occurrence. Sometimes, even when Uppy wasn't in the room, and we said, where's Mila? She was hiding in Uppy's room, munching on Uppy's raisins. <laughs> Mila had such a unique relationship with Uppy. One of the, the last, when Uppy's health took a turn for the worst, Mila asked, where's Uppy? Where's Uppy? And we had to tell her, Uppy is in the hospital. Uppy has a boo-boo. And for weeks, Mila said, Uppy has a boo-boo. Uppy has a boo-boo. You know, one of the last times I saw Uppy in the hospital, I sat beside her bed to pray. But instead of her praying for me, this time, I was praying for her. For years, this little old lady persistently prayed for her mischievous grandson that I would come to the knowledge of Christ and her prayers paid off. Her persistent prayers changed my life and I know so many other lives as well. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable of a persistent widow. The Bible reads, Then he spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in this city, and she came to this judge, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. Then he would not for a while, but then afterward the judge said to himself, Though I don't 
fear God nor regard man. Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. Then Jesus said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you this, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? In this parable, a widow was persistent in her petitions to a particular judge. And ultimately, she found favor in the eyes of that judge because of her persistence. Likewise, Uppy's faith in God was displayed in her life of persistent faith in Christ. Amen? Amen. To the very end, her faith never wavered. The promise of the resurrection was a reality in her heart. Uppy was persistent with her love for her family. She was persistent with her faith in God. And Uppy's memory will persist in our hearts forever. Amen. I'm going to read a poem called A Prayer in Spring. It's about addressing the divine. Quest for happiness, observing and appreciating delight in the love of nature. Focuses on love and gratitude of the coming spring. No one I have ever met meditated more on this than my uppie. A prayer in spring. Oh, give us pleasure in the flowers today and give us not to think so far away. As the uncertain harvest keep us here, all simply in the springing of the year. Oh, give us pleasure in the orchid white, like nothing else by day, like by night. And make us happy in the happy bees, the swarm dilating round the perfect trees. And make us happy in the darting bird that suddenly above the bees is heard, the meteor that thrusts in with the needle bill and off a blossom in midair stands still. For this love and nothing else is love, the which it is reserved for God above to sanctify to what far ends he will, but which it only needs that we fulfill. Pitang kumi chong tu kum samriat le pasari mi ni in April ni som pali sang ni som ni le pa ni kan chatuan ram min pan sana a memorial service kan nai na hian atupa pastor Rodik Remruata London hian tu soy na hun chatak mai aneya tin atunu Daphne po in poem soy na hun te aron na ya kan lom le mai mizo chong ah kan ron soy thay lo le kan ron let lo ero hi po i kan tia ang ay klak daan min lo thiam saktu rin in za vay chung ah kan ron ge na tin min lo thir saka min lo ngay klak saktu ta zong zong in za vay chung ah kan lo ma kan thiam ang tok le kan tlin tok kan ti thay te min lo lut saktu ta zong zong in za vay chung ah kan lo lalpan mal som vek chow ro se